I would like to uh, invite now Dr. Y. V. Reddy to deliver his talk. His talk, as we as we have already circulated, his talk is on center state relations review and prospects. Everybody is eagerly waiting to hear to you, sir. And I request all participants, if you have any questions, please put the questions in the chat box so that if Professor Eddy has the time, he can answer some of the questions, some selected questions we can select and we, can, we shall request Dr. Eddy to answer at the end of his talk. Put your questions and queries and your not suggestions, questions and queries in the chat box, any clarification in the chat box. It's over to you, sir with a lot of regards and once again, with a lot of thankfulness, we request you to deliver your talk on center state relations, review and prospects. Over to Professor Dr. Y.V. Reddy, sir. Thank you very much, Professor. Respected Vice Chancellor, Professor Sabita Acharya. Respected uh, Head of the Department, Dr. Himanshu Shekhar Raut, the President of the Alumni Association, Dr. Kumar, my dear friend, Dr. Swayam Prabhu Mishra, distinguished faculty, students, and friends. At the outset, I would like to express gratitude to the university and to the Alumni Association for considering me fit to be deliver this prestigious lecture. Professor Bijalar Mishra, from whatever I heard and read, is a distinguished, a passionate teacher, a distinguished scholar, an institution builder, and he, has, he was a visionary also. So he should be an inspire, inspiration for the current generation and perhaps for generations to come. I therefore, at the outset, pay my respects and tributes to his contribution and express our gratitude. Having accepted to give the lecture, my problem started. On what subject should I speak? Therefore, I had to think about a subject which is, which is, which is relevant to Professor Mishra. And also a subject in which I am not unfamiliar, at least I'm somewhat familiar with the subject. So after considerable thinking, I arrived at the subject center state relations, a review and prospects several reasons. One is that my thesis, PhD thesis, was on multi-level planning, and therefore I had to consider center state relations in that context, in the context of planning. Also, I worked in the state government. I worked later in the central government. Therefore, I know a bit of the way center functions and state function. Also, I worked in the finance commission. Therefore, I had to handle or at least understand the relations between the center and state rather closely. And in from the Reserve Bank of India, as a debt manager and as a fiscal advisor and as a banker, I could understand the state and the center. Therefore, I thought I can bring to bear my experience as well as familiarity with the subject in giving this talk. I propose to make the presentation briefly, one on a basic framework, the basic framework of the constitution, the center, state, and their relations. The second part will be the review of the past. Very brief because many of you may know the review of the past. I will quickly go through the recent developments and then end with way forward on the prospects. I will give a big picture only and I will not go into too much of a detail. First, basic framework of the constitution. What is, what is the meaning of center? N.T. Ramara, when he was chief minister in Andhra Pradesh, he said center is a myth. More recently, the finance minister of Tamil Nadu said that we will not call a center, we will call it whenever we write, we call it union of states. So what is this? So is there a center? when we talk of center state relations. The fact is that in the constitution, there's no word center. Center doesn't exist in the constitution. It is the only union of states. But it is no, it was it's very well known, central refers to union government. But it's a union of states, 
but it's not it, it, when it comes to a state how uh, did the states come together and form the union or did the did the, the states and the union simultaneously form what happened so union union of states is given but the composition of the states keep changing that very interesting how it can happen it can, it happened because when the constitution was framed at that time there is a partition there are 500 and that princely states and there is no agreement on what should be the basis on which the state should be constituted therefore on a somewhat ad hoc basis four categories were created a b c d and some states were created there are 19 states and six provinces six uh, union territories but what happened was that after some time there is a demand for linguistic states actually the idea of linguistic state was discussed even after independence before the before the constitution was adopted there is difference of opinion and a committee of jawaharlal nehru vallabhai patel and tata bhi sitaramayya decided that it's better not to have linguistic states at least not for the present so that is how the states were formed in an ad hoc basis the constitution formed both the union of states and the states also after some time there was an agitation for a linguistic state was in 1953 in 1956 linguistic country was formed on the basis of linguistic states so in a way therefore and after that again from time to time there are agitations to separate maharashtra and gujarat from old bombay state so new states were created from time to time so this process went on and whenever new state is created there is a process and the process involves consent of the concerned state assembly not consent consultation not consent consultation of the concerned state this went on till recently more recently in 2014 not do not strictly do consent was not given andhra and telangana were separated so the first time some controversy arose about the formation of the state otherwise almost all new states that were formed non controversy so one recent development is controversial creation of separation of andhra and telangana second controversial the controversial jammu and kashmir the state of kashmir became union territory it became union to it became union territories so in a way therefore the formation of the center is a union of states but the states themselves may keep changing but this process was non controversial but the recent development is that consent is not necessary consultation is necessary even that can be done with the governor in the case of in case there is a president's rule so in a way therefore now there is a fear among some states that the state can be divided by the union government if there were a majority in the parliament eliminated so in a way states feel a little little uh, scared of the possibility of the state itself being divided so this is a recent development but so far i don't think it has taken any serious proportion so we should leave it there and say understand that center state relations are peculiar in the sense that states can be in a way created or destroyed if the center is determined to do so through extraordinary measures this be, this means that there is unequal relationship between the center and states now does it mean that states are entirely at the mercy of the center no the constitutional framework gives separate powers for center separate powers for the state and there so there is a state list there is a central list there is also a concurrent list where both can uh, function however to the extent that the central government legislation prevails whenever there is a conflict center is superior also residual matters are all with the center only not with the state so these factors and thirdly the states borrowing state cannot borrow outside and inside also whenever they want to borrow they have to take the permission of the government of india as long as they owe money to government of india so this creates some sort of asymmetric relations and actually it so happens that considering the responsibilities the tax powers are less so the state government roughly they spend 60% of the budget of the expenditure center 40% but the resources are the other way about center has lot more resources than the state therefore there is a mechanism required to transfer 
researcher from time to time. For this, uh, an institu uh, institution arrangement has been made in the constitution. That arrangement is finance commission. Every five years, it comes into existence every five years, or before five years also, if necessary. The finance commission, what it does is it has uh, three functions. One is it is the principles on which the taxes collected by the center are shared. Second, it also gives the principles that govern granting aid or recommends granting aid. And third, any matter which has in the interest of sound finance, these are called additional matters. These terms of reference may be given by the uh, president when constituting the finance commission. Finance commission is a sort of an expert body. So, except for this institutional arrangement in regard to fiscal relations, there are no other arrangements for interstate center coordination except that an institution was created. It is called Interstate Council. It was created through a constitutional amendment on the recommendation of a Sarkaria Commission. One thing that can be found is number of commissions which went through the Administrative Reforms Committee, Kunj Committee, number of commissions and committees recommended that there should be institutional mechanisms for consultation between the center and states. However, this did not come into existence. Even the Interstate Council, which has been created under the constitution, has been placed in the whole ministry and it is not very active. Therefore, in a way, the central government has not been very keen to have institutional arrangements for consultation. Center is not very keen to have institutional arrangements. So in a way, therefore, the states cannot join together and take on the center. However, there are two, three issues that come up in all the relations. One is vertical. Even on financial matters, there is a vertical balance. There should be balance between the center and states. So that requires some transfer of money from the center to states and some sharing of the taxes collected by the center. But there's also horizontal. The states, the states, when, they, when the money goes from the center to the states, there should be horizontal balance. So then the question is whether you should go on the basis of efficiency or contribution to the economy and taxes, or on the basis of need, which will be the poverty or population. So this type of uh, uh, balance has to be there. And this balance also will not be static. Things change, some states develop fast, some states don't develop fast, some states don't control population, some states control population. And the central, uh, the technology changes, the relationship with the global economy change, Central government's obligations to global economy may change. So therefore, we have got in these center-state relations, particularly in fiscal relations, you have balances of vertical balance and horizontal balance in a dynamic context. So this is the broad framework within which the center-state relations have been from time to time. Now, if the basic structure is so much, so much in favor of center, why is it that the states are not subordinate? Sometimes they, they do take on the center in a variety of ways from time to time. I gave you the example of anti Ramara giving a statement of Tamil Nadu minister. It is because of the democratic process and each state are elects its own leader. And so here's the following. So there's a democratic, uh, democratic backing uh, to the chief minister when they deal with the prime minister. Though the prime minister has a larger role by virtue of the preponderance of the central response parts and responsibilities related to the state. The, however, the relationship essentially, in a way, depends on the prime minister. Because the, though the chief ministers have their own standing, the prime minister as the chief executive of the central government has an important role to play. And that is where you will find interesting developments if you want a review of the past. Pandit Nehru was a great Democrat. But one thing he did as soon as he became, after becoming Prime Minister, is create planning commission and introduce planning process. Now, you know, planning means centralization. So in a way, the center state relation in the center state relations, the powers of the state were in a way undermined by the very cause, creation of the planning commission. And it is not a, it is by administrative order. 
It is not by legislation. It is not in the constitution. So Nehru, uh, but Nehru believed in consultations with the chief ministers. He used to write letters even about central subjects like defense, external affairs. He used to have very good relationship with all the chief ministers. But he created and he had uh, he created a national development council where he used to have which had frequent meetings. So in a way, Nehru is a contradiction. He had consultations with the chief ministers, good relations with chief ministers. He was a democrat, but he created a process of planning which created centralization. So that is the interesting part of his contribution, if I may put it that way. But later, after he left and after the interregnum with Lal Bhagavad Shasti, uh, Mr. Indira Gandhi became the prime minister. Now, initially, she was somewhat weak. Around that time, there was a lot of criticism that the planning commission is giving money to states in an arbitrary manner without consulting. There should be a formula. Central cannot go on giving at the way they, it likes. Therefore, a formula came into existence, uh, recommended by a great economist, Professor Gatti. So what happened is after Nehru left, when Mrs. Gandhi became prime minister, formula-based transfers Apart from finance commission, finance commission is always uh, is a, every five years is independent body. But the planning commission, which was the source of centralization during Nehru's days, the money transfer became formula driven. That's called Gadgil formula. Therefore, some element of assertion by the states happened. But soon after a few years, Mrs. Gandhi became a lot more powerful. Then she became powerful in the planning commission transfers also. Interest schemes were introduced, centrally sponsored scheme, that scheme, this scheme. So in a way, the formula base became less, the discretion uh, transfer became more and more. Then we have, uh, but it does not mean, again, very interestingly, it does not mean that the prime minister is all powerful. In the case of Mrs. Gandhi, there are two examples. Again, Chandra. Mr. P. V. Narsimha who later became prime minister, was chief minister of Andhra Pradesh. He belongs to Indira Gandhi's party only. He was chief minister. However, the local people revolted. And therefore, Mrs. Indira Gandhi as prime minister had to introduce president's rule in a state where Congress party was in majority, in a state where Congress party was in majority. And he, she had to remove Venus. There's a second instance where Mrs. Gandhi, though very powerful, had to concede when N.T. Ramarao or became chief minister after some time, he was dismissed. Again, after a few weeks, because the re revolt in the state, Mrs. Gandhi had to reinstate him. He was very critical of Mrs. Gandhi. So in a way, therefore, we got the situation, center is framework-wise as well as functioning, is loaded in favor of the center, but center is not all powerful. There's a dynamic balance. This balance, sometimes center asset, sometimes state asset, and this, this dynamic balance should be understood. Uh, and in fact, in a way, the country is held together by this dynamic balance. Uh, after that, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi became the prime minister. He tried to introduce a third tier decentralization, Panchayat Raj. A third tier was introduced in the, in the constitution. Though he started it, it was done after him. But at his initiative, a third tier was introduced that is the Panchayat Raj institutions and local bodies. Interestingly, though it has been, constitution has been amended, the effective decentralization has not taken place till now in many states, not what was envisaged. In a way, therefore, though the cent at the in initiative of the center, the constitution itself was amended to create a third tier, it has not been effectively created in the states in which they are not very keen to initiate. So again, you've got another case of balance, uh, which is changing. After that, Mr. P. V. Narasimharao became the prime minister. Mr. P. V. Narasimharao was a coalition government. And he therefore left the states to on their own. And he concentrated on economic reform. During the economic reform period, the central government's role in the economy reduced. In a way, the state's freedom increased. When the centers, centers management of the economy became less, 
relatively the state's capacity to manage the economy increased. And then what happened, he was followed by Mr. Bajpai, Atil Bihari Bajpai. Again, coalition government, and he was again, his style, personal style, was consensus building coordination. He was followed by Manmohan Singh. Again, soft-spoken, accommodative. In 15 years, the state became more and more sort of independent thinking. So you had many models of development, Orissa model of development, Gujarat model of development, Bihar model of development. See, these models of development of different states came about during the period when there was no centralized leadership. So in a way, therefore, centralized assertive leadership, let me put it that way. In a way, therefore, uh, we had a situation till recently of, uh, of what I may call multiple models of development, not a centralized, uh, powerful model of development. And then we have the more recent developments after 2014, what I may call Modi era. I will come to that under the heading recent developments. So this, this is a broad picture I wanted to give in terms of personality. Now about the institutions. The institutions also correspondingly change. As I mentioned, there are not many institutions that have been created. One was finance company. Finance Commission, by and large, there was, a, there was an element for continuity and change. Every five years, the Finance Commission looked at things and made some changes and whatever made, made some recommendations. One interesting thing is that till the latest Finance Commission, all the Finance Commission recommendations were considered as awards. There was no question of disagree. Terms of reference were non-controversial. Recommendations were by and large, by and large, formula based and a few grants. So this is the history of the Finance Commission. There are some Finance Commissions who made fundamental changes in fundamental recommendations, but they are done in a, in a very collaborative manner after informal consultations. There is only one case where there was serious difference of opinion, and that was whether Finance Commission should look at uh, plan plan expenditures also, and that there's a dissent note, and the government agreed with the dissent note, which wanted plan plan to be outside the finance commission jurisdiction. So basically, the history of finance commissions is terms of reference generally non-controversial. Terms of reference sometimes to, had a little tilt in favor of the center, but by and large, the recommendations were non-controversial and adopted as an award by the Senate till the 15th finance commission. I'll come to that in the recent developments. Another institution which was very important and very controversial, of course, for some time, was the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission, as I mentioned, was created by during Pandit Nehru's time. Planning Commission became what is known as extra constitutional authority because they are in a position to influence the flow of resources from the center to state, though it had no constitutional backing. Technically, it was a recommendatory body, though, but its recommendations were more or less binding. Sometimes the chief ministers were unhappy with the planning commission, but however, it continued to play an active role. It was, and however, in 2014, if you come under recent developments, um, planning commission was abolished, and National Development Council also was abolished. It was replaced by Niti Ayog and uh, Governing Council. This is a fundamental institutional change that has happened. So basically one institution outside the constitution, there is one institution in the finance, finance commission in the constitution. There's one outside the constitution, which is a forum for interstate consultation stations that has been abolished, a new institution has been created. So now we have to assess in the recent developments what it, what it is functioning, how it's functioning. Uh, the interesting part of it is even National Development Council, the meetings over a period became less frequent, less frequent. So, in, and also in Planning Commission, also the influence of the Planning Commission became less and less, particularly because, as I mentioned, three consecutive prime ministers, P. Nasimarao, Bajpai, and uh, Manmohan Singh, 
they are leave it, they prefer to leave as much as possible to the states and uh, and so that was an atmosphere that was that was created uh, now outside that there are actually um, no no institutional mechanisms now let us come to the recent developments the in the integrated institutions um no, first let me start with the recent developments. Mr. Modi became the prime minister. And from then on, there has been a dramatic change. Mr. Modi was chief minister and by all accounts, very popular and successful chief minister. And when he was chief minister, he was very critical of the central government's overreach. So some people or many people expected that after he becomes the prime minister, the state governments will be strengthened and more freedom will be given to the state governments. And he also insisted on cooperative federalism. Whereas some other people felt that because he was a chief minister, he is very familiar with the state subjects. Therefore, he may try to run the state subjects also from this. So what happened is that that or this, is a matter of history. I think we have, we have to make our own judgments. But let me narrate some of the things that happened. And therefore, where, are, where do we stand? I think that's what we are interested in. Here. First thing is planning commission. Planning commission was abolished. In a way, initially, the state chief ministers felt, oh, it's good, this extra constitutional authority has gone. But then it was realized that there is no forum in which the chief ministers could meet and meet and have interaction together with the Prime Minister. So in a way, therefore, while Planning Commission was considered to be an instrument of the center, it was also a forum for interaction between the center and states. Planning Commission was a forum for interaction between the center and states. And a total view of each state was also taken. So that forum disappeared. Niti Aayog became only a central, and since and the dealings were in the individual ministries. It became only political. Whereas planning commission was a buffer. The, the technical people also in the planning commission, center, state, working groups, interaction at different levels, technical level, bureaucratic level, which happened under the umbrella of the planning commission. That process has gone. Therefore, in a way, now there is a vacuum. There is a vacuum in terms of form of continuous interaction. So individual ministries have become more powerful uh, than the states and states who uh, have lost in ever the forum. Now let us come to the finance. Uh, let let me come to the Niti uh, is functioning, uh, no doubt. There is also a governing council, but it is less frequent. You don't hear or read much about what's happened. So therefore, we are basically left with the finance commission. The Finance Commission, 14th Finance Commission, again, true to the tradition, Mr. Modi as Prime Minister accepted all the recommendations of the 14th Finance Commission. It was treated as an award. So that way, the, 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 the tradition was respected. Award, it was treated as an award. All the recommendations were accepted. In fact, he announced that he believes in cooperative federalism and increased the transfer also he has accepted to 42%. But what happened was in actual implementation, two things happened. In actual implementation, the cessation and surcharges increased. Cessation were supposed to be abolished with GST codes. Actually, cessation increased, surcharge increased. Cessation and surcharges are not shared with the center. Therefore, effective transfer from the central states came down. In a way, the letter of the recommendation of the I accepted. In implementation, it was valued. It was diluted considerably. This became a source of tension. Then comes the 15th public finance commission. In the 15th finance commission, the terms of reference became a controversy. Earlier terms of reference were rarely a controversy. Only one finance commission, there was a controversy when the government, the terms of reference included the norms, norms for uh, expenditure of various schemes. There's only occasion. Whereas in the, came, in the 15th finance commission came, Number of terms of reference became controversial. Basically, one of course was the population, whether it should be the current population, past population. 
that uh, there can be a difference of opinion. The second thing is the finance commission was specifically asked to review the substantial increase given to states. In a way, the terms of reference are trying to say that 14 finance commission gave substantially higher amount, uh, higher share to states, and therefore a review, which is almost telling the arbitrator what bias he should have. So that was one criticism. Second criticism is they wanted transfers to be uh, the recommendations to take into consideration the performance. And performance indicators also were given by the, uh, by the terms of reference. The performance indicators refer to only the programs of the government of India. And even the programs really in the state subjects. So in a way, what the terms of reference said is that the money to the states will go on the basis of the extent to which, at least some of it, the extent to which they implement the programs of the central government. So in a way, therefore, it became uh, very controversial because it affects states' discretion. And uh, a particular party is in the party center, they have some priorities. State level, if it's a different party, it may have different priorities. So there's a conflict. This became a matter of dispute between the finance commission itself. So that's another area. Finally, the terms of reference say that borrowing, permission of, to give borrowing, to allow the states to borrow, should be subject to conditions, can be subject to conditions. So this is another unusual thing, because borrowing is based on some formula, some basis. Now to say that it should be, some conditions can be put by government of India, which are to programs. So in a way, virtually what they are telling the finance, what the government of India, in the view of some critics, was that the government of India is telling the finance commission that please recommend transfers to states only if they implement my program or if they implement my priorities. You know, this was the feeling of many states and there were a lot of criticism. Some of them also said it's unconstitutional. Of course, there can always be another opinion. The national government is important. National priorities are important and centralized implementation may be more efficient. We cannot take a side, but the fact remains that there is a controversy. There have been controversies. Now, as far as the recommendations are concerned, I, I don't want to go into it because having been a chairman of 14th Finance Commission, I should not be sitting in judgment about the 15th Finance Commission's recommendations. But again, in the context of the acceptance of the government of India, it is called action taken report. What are the decisions the government of India takes? This action taken report is placed before the parliament. In the action taken report, there are very interesting things that happen. One, state-specific grants were given, were recommended by the Finance Commission. State-specific grants accepted, but will be considered, action taken will be, will be considered, to, uh, will, be, uh, will be taken in due consideration, will be given due consideration. It was not accepted, but uh, due consideration was considered accepted. But you are not sure what will happen. Similarly, borrowing program conditionality. Similarly, sector-specific. Sector-specific grants are also recommended. Even sector-specific grants also. It was said that it will be subject to, it will, it will be considered in the process of finalizing the central sponsored schemes. So in a way, therefore, I accept a share of taxes. Almost all other transfers will be subject to some conditionality or other, which, is, which has become a sort of source of uh, sour relations. Now, there's another most interesting development during this period uh, uh, is GST, goods and services tax. Now, this is a new institution which has been created recently. It's a remarkable achievement. This has been in a discussion for almost two decades. So it has been brought into existence, that is pretty worthy. But the GST council essentially is consists of the finance ministers of the state and the finance. Now we have got a forum. The forum is the state, but that, was, that is restricted only to the GST matters. At least that's, that's one achievement. There is a forum. And it is meeting often, trying to take actions. Now, how about functioning? If you look at the functioning, there has been some problems because the amounts that were interstate tax, which was to be given by the center to states, the accounts, they're supposed to be given 
from time to time, every two months, finalize the accounts, I think. The accounts were not finalized. The amount was kept and used by the central government. So the state government felt that central government is using their share as a ways and means at once. But sometimes that happened. Secondly, states are supposed to get compensation. Normally, such compensation should be given by the, from the central budget. However, it was assessed was agreed, assessed was levied in order to pay. Assessed is actually is like a tax. In the tax, the state and center share, and assessed only center gets. So central government, in order to give the money due to the state, has taken away some of the tax money which is due to the state. Anyway, but even this, the assessed generating surplus in the first one or two years. When the surplus was generated, that was used up by the center. After two years with the COVID, it became deficit. The amount was not enough. When it became deficit, the central government asked the state governments to borrow. And state governments had problems. Then the central government said, I will borrow, but I'll give it to you and back to back to business. So again, there is certain disagreement, partly by, because of COVID, but partly also feeling that that center may not be acting in good faith and it's not been fair. Center's answer is we are having a problem. We ourselves are having a problem. How can we go on insisting on this? So this type of uh, tensions have come about. Now comes the COVID, which is another important issue. COVID, we know that it's a big, very big problem. Not, not a national problem alone, it's an international problem also. In the past, whenever there was uh, an epidemic or a vaccine has to be given, the central government is to supply the vaccine. Free. The state governments have to incur all other expenditure. The staff taking them, administering them. The whole administration was the state. So states were the burden, but the central gave the vaccine free. Now, after when this COVID came, central gave, took only part of the burden, and some and states also were asked to buy their own vaccine to some extent. There's one sort of difference of opinion or tension. Secondly, there are centralized decisions taken. Subsequently, there was some correction made. Overall, the impression that the state feel is that normally in the case of a crisis, crisis, the central government comes like a big brother and supports the state. That's the general, general approach is central is like a big brother to support the states. In this case, when the COVID came, the feeling of the state is the center is discussing burden sharing. So you don't share a burden. When there's a crisis, because only states have budget concerns, not budget constraints. So these are the type of tensions that have come. I am not um, referring to the other types of complaints which the states may have, whether justified or not. But one, one recent uh, development is the monetization scheme. In that, many of the central public enterprises, they got land from the state governments, either free or at a concessional rate. So when the central government got a land only for its use, it was meant to be used by the central government enterprise. So now when the central government is selling their land or making money out of the land, the state government feels this, we gave it to you at a concessional rate because you are located in it. But if you are selling or leasing, we should have a share in it. This subject came up with regard to Cochin Airport also. So these, another, these type of tensions also are coming up in the case of minor ports, etc. So the limited point that I want to end with the recent developments is a lot of very important changes, fundamental changes have happened in the country, like GST. At the same time, there are tensions between the center and state. There are not tensions, are at least strained relations in number of ways, in number of ways. Uh, and, uh, there, and therefore, what, how do we see it going at the moment? At the moment, I think the, the tensions are spilling over to political, perhaps even bureaucratic, perhaps even investigative agencies. So they're spilling over beyond finance also. So how the, what are the prospects? And this is the matter on which we have to consider things carefully. See, first thing is that the areas of the, 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 the changes are huge. The, the areas of difference are huge. They're deep. There are large areas of strained relations are large, several sectors. They are deep. They are fundamental. That's one problem. Second problem is 
that important metropolitan cities where there is maximum economic activity, Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, they are, they are ruled by a different political party. So these tensions between states which are and the big cities which are governed by different parties and, and this intergovernmental and inter-party tension, party tensions also create problems in the overall governance. And um, also, I think there are no fora of debate, exchange, discussion, etc., as much as perhaps required. In a way, therefore, I think we are at a critical stage where these sort of tensions will have to be resolved, either through institutional mechanisms or through some other means, uh, political fora, intellectual fora, academic fora, all should have to work together to reduce the tensions and work and you, I think some research will be needed, what type of institutional Sir, you have been muted. Excuse me. Ready, sir. Can you hear me? Sir, please unmute yourself. You have been muted. Professor Eti, you have got muted. Yes. No, no. He, yes, okay. yes, 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 yes. Yes. Is it unmuted? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's okay. It is not due to any tensions. I have been unmuted only by accident. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. <laughs> yes, yes. Please go <laughs> ahead. Please go ahead, sir. Okay. Then I will conclude. Uh, so, surely, I think these tensions will get sorted out. Uh, I'm sure in the, in the usual Indian way, in the usual messy way, I may put it that way. Um, and uh, I think more important is the next phase of economic reforms are state subjects, labor, agriculture, many are state subjects, of course, education, education is concurrent. Health. So I think if you want a economy to progress, uh, we have to seek mechanisms of resolving these tensions, uh, or these tension, possible tensions in the relations, uh, and they have to work together. It will happen, but it's better it happens sooner, quicker, amicably, smoothly. Thank you very much. Again, I'm grateful to you for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir. That was a really interesting talk and a very lively talk. Sir, uh, with your permission, can we take a few questions, sir? Yeah. Have... Yes, sir. Uh, so there are some a few questions. Uh, so, uh, sir, you are muted, sir. Please unmute. I want to take a break for two minutes. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Please take a break. Please I'll come back. back. I'll come back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, dear participants, it has been a very lively, very enchanting, and a very uh, interesting talk. I'm sure you all have enjoyed it. Is like hearing from uh, from an insider's perspective a person who has got a got the vision from both inside and outside and a very perfectly for, uh, very nicely he has uh, professor eddy has taken us uh, through the historical development how it has developed the center state relationships whether the center state relationship is a reality or it's a myth or does the center exist that the name as the, the term center as he has already said does not exist in the constitution so what are the how it has developed over different uh, uh, rulings and he has taken us through that and he has also brought in the role of the uh, planning commission I and mean, the finance commission uh, he has spoken touched upon issues like devolution the horizontal uh, uh, balance the vertical balance and most of the aspects of interest that he has uh, he has touched upon and he has also given us a, 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 how it is going to be solved and what not only a review also a per, per, per perspective of the things that as it is going to develop in the coming times so i think uh, our participants are requested to post their questions uh, in the chat box 
so that uh, we can uh, uh, take up the questions one by one. As uh, a few questions, we cannot take all the questions. We're, we're extremely sorry. So, but we'll still take a few questions and we shall wait for Dr. Eddy to come back to answer our questions. The first question, as I can see, is on impact of COVID-19. And I have got a few, a lot more questions are also coming up. Mm -hmm. So please come up with your questions. We shall try to take up as many possible as uh, is possible on the part of Dr. Y. V. Reddy to take on. Uh, madam, in between, uh, oh, okay, sir came already. Sir has come, yes, sir. Anything you want, you want to do, sir? No, no, just I wanted to tell ki maybe 30 seconds to give to Professor Misra if he wants to tell something, his son, Professor Gopavandu. Okay, Mishra. yes, sir, Gopavandu, sir, is there. Yeah, I will, I'll ask. Sir, can I, can I just read, read a few questions, sir? Please, please. Yes, sir. So one that is... One after another. Yes, sir. Of course, of course, sir. Sir, one question is uh, how this COVID-19 has uh, so, uh, impacted the center-state relation and the role of the devolution index in this uh, relationship. It is from Pradeep Kumar Panda. COVID-19 and center-state relations. See, COVID-19 COVID is a very uh, unprecedented type of shock. And therefore, uh, it's very difficult uh, to say um, how it should have been handled. It's always easy to criticize. Yes, sir. The fact remains. Therefore, I think we should start with the caveat, whatever I say or whatever anybody says. It's an unprecedented situation for the world, for, the, for India also. Therefore, you cannot say that this, this should be the way. But fact remains that immediately whenever there is a problem like this, the burden is on the local government, local staff, because the administrative center doesn't have administrative machinery. Center doesn't have administrative machinery in the, in the villages, in the taluks, etc. So therefore, center has to function through the state administrative machinery. And the state comes face to face with the problem. Center can provide money and material. So this is the real sector view. As far as the resources are concerned, resources of states are generally constrained in any case. And they have hard budget constraints. So center is in a position to make a judgment about the relative financial burden. On the real sector, it's only a question of supply of vaccine. On the financial sector, supply of money. Yes, sir. And therefore, and in a situation like this, while the states have to deliver, the center has to support its mind. And how it is to be done, there will always be some controversies or other. I don't think we can sit in judgment. And too important a matter to be mutually critical. But the limited point is, in real, in real terms, in reality, states have to deliver. But the center has, has a necessary flexibility of financial issue. Center has flexibility to borrow, flexibility to print. Center don't have, states don't have. So therefore, in a way, center has to be both guiding and supporting role. But the delivery point is the state. So every, every relationship should follow from that. Secondly, there should not be a feeling that states are being discriminated against. In a matter like this, there should be no basis for any discrimination. That feeling should not be given. These are the general response I can make. But for, as I said, Unless you have the details, and even if you have details, you cannot pass it. In. Thank you, sir. So there is a question from Professor Manoj Panda, who asks, Dr. Eddy, is it time to go for an overall review of the constitutional provisions related to center and state relation and introduce new institutions for better functioning in future? 
Uh, well, uh, as I said, there is even an existing institution, Interstate Council, which has been created after the recommendation of the Sarkaria Commission. There is a commission, Sarkaria Commission went into exactly the same subjects, interstate relations. They recommended a body. That body has been created, it's still not being used. So creating the institution does not necessarily mean that they will work. Now, I think first thing is, and secondly, as I explained to you through the, throughout the history, much depends on the personalities also. So my answer is, institutions may be useful. They have been recommended, they have not been adopted, but it will be a good thing if institutions are created, but it will be useful only if they are properly uh, functioning. So yes, it will be useful to consider. Another commission may consider. But if they are established, they should be used. So maybe one way is, I would suggest, let us start using interstate council more effectively. There is an existing institution. There is a constitutional body. Why not use inter existing constitutional body more effectively? I think more or less that's the recommendation which we had made uh, for in the 14th Finance Commission. Thank you, sir. It's quite interesting. So another question from Professor Siblal Meher, who asked, even after the award of the 15th Finance Commission, so regional fiscal imbalance still remains. After the award of 15th Finance Commission, so regional fiscal imbalance still remains. Is it due to adoption of faulty formula, sir? What is your opinion? No, I think there are two things. The, the opinion starts with the assumption that fiscal imbalances remain. No, there's nothing like a perfect fiscal balance. So, that, so, so in a way, therefore, you cannot say whether there is imbalance and if so, what imbalance because in every award, some states feel that they have been uh, wrong. But one thing is that I can say if uh, we to say again, Vertical imbalance or horizontal imbalance? What are we talking about? Are we talking about vertical imbalance or horizontal imbalance? So he is talking about horizontal imbalance, sir. Horizontal is among the among the among the states. Among, among the states. states. Yes, sir. Say so, yes. So how do you the, the problem here again is how do you judge a fiscal imbalance? How do you conclude fiscal imbalance or fiscal balance? Yes, sir. How uh, to measure? It, how to quantify? Yes. How to quantify? Yes. yes. So there are variety of considerations. Basically, three things. Population is the need. Simplest is the population. Second, second area is not population, but efficiency. Whether you have efficiently collected taxes, whether you are going, should the forward states get back position. So efficiency concept, need concept. But there is a third compromise. The compromise is minimum levels of service should be enabled to all citizens of the country. Every citizen of the country should be enabled to have a minimum level of government service, services from the government, education, health. So the third at least should be satisfied. The fact remains that there are inequalities among the states. They can never be perfectly equal. It's a process. It's a process. Thank you, sir. So as you rightly pointed out, perfect balance and a perfect equality is a myth. Uh, yes. So there is a yes. question from a student, sir, and the yes. student, Madhav Devri, he asked that if there are different parties ruling in the state and the center, and there is a difference in their uh, lookout and politics, will it affect the development perspective of a state? Uh, if you just see the growth in the last 30, 40 years, let us take empirical evidence. Since he's a student, he can take the empirical evidence and see whether the states with the ruling party at the center are doing better, whether the same party is ruling at the center and states, are the states for economic growth better, or the states where the opposition party is ruling, the growth is better. I suppose that's one indicator. If you see the data, you'll find interestingly, there are three national parties, Congress, BJP, and um, communists. If you see the history, those states which were ruled by the, by the national parties did not grow as rapidly as the states which are ruled by regional parties. In spite of all this that we have discussed, in reality, economic growth, so in terms of performance, the regional parties, the state which are run by regional parties are doing better. Therefore, I think all in all, if the assumption is that 
if the national party and the state party is the same, it will be harmonious. Relationship it will be harmonious, but it may not be efficient. Actually, if the regional party is running the state, and the national party is running the center, that state is doing better. 